Welcome everyone to the June 2019 edition of the Collaborative Mentoring Webinar Series. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar on mentoring youth impacted by opioids. This webinar is part of the Collaborative Mentoring Webinar Series, which is funded by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention through the National Mentoring Resource Center and facilitated in partnership with Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership. These webinars would not be possible without our webinar planning team, which includes the mentor state and regional affiliates that are shown on this slide. In addition to this webinar series, the National Mentoring Resource Center provides many other useful resources for mentoring practitioners. At the end of this webinar, we'll provide more details about how you can access this no cost support and resources for your programs. Before we get started, I wanted to share some quick housekeeping information. In one week, all of you will receive an email with information about how to download a copy of these slides and also view the webinar recording. You'll also be able to access this information directly by going to Mentor's website within the next week. And to continually help us improve the series, we're looking for your input. As you exit the survey, uh, as you exit the webinar, a short survey will pop up. Please help us out by taking three minutes to give us your feedback about today's session. We want this to be a participatory experience for the audience, so please feel free to use the question box to ask questions throughout the webinar. My colleague from the webinar planning team, Pamela Gant from Mentor Washington, will be queuing up questions to share with panelists during the Q&A portion of the webinar at the end. We may not be able to get to all of your questions because there are several hundred of you on the webinar, but we'll do our best. The questions that we share with our panelists are generally ones that multiple people have asked us and have not yet been covered by the material during the rest of the webinar. Our panelists have also volunteered to share their email addresses. So if we don't get to your question, you'll have the opportunity to reach out to them directly after the webinar. And finally, as we get started today, we have two short polls just to learn a little bit more about who's in the audience for today's webinar. So the first poll is asking, what is your experience level in the mentoring field? It looks like um, just about 60% of you are experienced in the mentoring field, 36 beginner, and 4% um, consider yourselves experts. Now our second poll is asking just quickly, what is your role in the mentoring field? Great, it looks like exactly half of you are mentoring practitioners um, with a solid amount of people that fall under the other category. So it, it would be interesting to see as we look at who uh, registered for the webinar after this, who falls into that category. Um, but now that we've gotten a chance to hear who's in the audience, let me tell you a little bit more about who's joining us for today's webinar on the panelist side. Um, but first I'm gonna start by sharing briefly our goals for today's webinar and then I'll introduce you to the panelists. Our three primary goals today are to help participants develop a better understanding of the effects of the opioid epidemic and how mentoring programs can help address this issue. Second, to provide a, a clinical overview of how to support youth who have or are at risk of developing substance use disorder. And lastly, we want to be able to offer hands-on strategies insights and best practices that mentoring practitioners can utilize to better support the youth that they're serving in their programs who are impacted by opioids. I'll start things off here by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Benji Thurber, and I'm the Communications Director for Mentor Vermont and the facilitator for today's webinar. Um, I'm a member of the Collaborative Mentoring Webinar Series Planning Team, which is made up of representative from Mentor's state and regional affiliates from across the country. Um, our team works with Mentor to brainstorm topics that are relevant to the mentoring field and helps 
bring in experts from around the country to present on these monthly webinars. And now let me introduce you to our first panelist, Elizabeth Joy. Elizabeth is the founder of Survivors to Alivers, Inc. and author of You Survived, Now What? A Roadmap to Reclaiming Life. She is a licensed social worker and drug and alcohol counselor. Elizabeth's experience includes work in youth mentoring, child welfare, mental health, corrections, and alcohol and drug treatment. Our second panelist is Gabriela Zapata Alma, and she is the Director of Policy and Practice for Domestic Violence and Substance Use at the National Center for Domestic Violence, Trauma, and Mental Health as well as a lecturer at the University of Chicago. Gabriella brings 15 years of experience working with people living with HIV and AIDS, impacted by housing instability, substance use disorders, and mental health conditions, as well as survivors of domestic violence and other trauma, providing direct services, training, advocacy, and consultation, and leading programs using a trauma-informed approach, motivational interviewing, harm reduction, gender-responsive care, Housing First, and Third Wave Behavioral Interventions. And lastly, our third panelist for today's webinar is Chris Holtquist, the Executive Director of the Mentor Connector, a mentoring agency that serves youth in Rutland County, Vermont. Chris's experience includes leading a consulting organization that provided turnaround management, strategic planning, and leadership development for 30 businesses, municipalities, and organizations. He has also served as a mental health and substance abuse school-based clinician and created a self-funded training institute, which was a collaboration between local community college and a large-scale manufacturer to assist in the training, employment, and retention of local youth. And now that we've met all of today's panelists, I'm going to pass the microphone off to Elizabeth Joy, who's going to start us off by talking about the opioid epidemic and some ways that the youth mentoring field can help address the effects of opioids in our local communities. Good afternoon, everyone. It's Elizabeth Joy, and as uh, Benji indicated, I will be sharing, um, just starting with some stats and sort of an overview regarding the um, opioid overdose epidemic. Um, we're gonna talk about a little bit how mentoring comes in. And then lastly, I'm going to share with you um, a little bit about the project that I'm involved with, with the National Mentoring Partnership, in which we are creating um, some responses and uh, resources for mentoring programs throughout the country. So moving to the next slide, um, just looking at the overall drug use uh, nationally, and these uh, stats all come from SAMHSA, we can see here that um, opioids are the second uh, most used drug, and these stats are from uh, 2016 to uh, 2017 and include ages 12 and up. Um, interestingly, um, and I think it's important to note that marijuana is actually um, uh, number one used drug currently. And so again, we have opioids in second and um, uh, one of the things that I wanted to point out regarding the marijuana use, which um, came out in my listening tour, is that uh, when we look at the amount of marijuana use that's happening, we're seeing an increase in um, marijuana being laced with opioids. And so it's really important that we watch that stat for marijuana as well. So moving on to the next slide, uh, we have sort of just an overview here of opioid misuse. And it's important to note that heroin is included um, in these numbers. And so you see here that approximately 11.4 million people are currently struggling with opioid misuse, which is about 4.2% of the population. In the next slide, um, it breaks down the various uh, subtypes of opioids with uh, buprenorphine being the most used um, subtype of opioids with uh, important to point out meth as number two. I think, you know, with the opioid uh, epidemic being, you know, so top of mind, and this actually came out of my listening tour as well, um, it's important that we don't overlook the fact that meth is still very much um, an active reality in uh, the worlds of those who are struggling with drug use. And then lastly, on the far right, you see fentanyl, 
um, coming in at 12%, and that um, has come up as oftentimes one of the uh, subtypes of opioids that are laced in other drugs, which is important to note. On this slide here, the next slide, I'm sorry, um, this is just showing the prescription pain relief reliever misuse by age. And um, as you can see there in the middle, and I think it's important to note, and this will come up uh, later in points I'll cover, is that age 18 to 25 um, is, is the age group that's using the most. And it's also important to note that there has been a decrease in prescription opioid use um, from 2015 through 17. In the next slide, you'll see as well, um, regarding heroin use, again, you're seeing that age 18 to 25 being the um, most common age in which um, there's been misuse of that drug. The next piece um, on the heroin usage, which I find interesting, is that although the heroin use has declined as far as new users, we're actually seeing more deaths as a result of heroin which as a result of heroin use, which I think speaks to the potency of the drugs we're seeing in the opioid epidemic. And then lastly, on the next slide, um, another very interesting um, piece of statistics is that um, while we hear a lot about um, prescription drugs being the driver or prescription from doctors being the driver of opioids, and it's certainly a concern, as you see in this data here, 53.1% um, of those um, misusing got their drug from either a friend or a relative. So just important to keep that in mind as we think about how to serve folks who are struggling with opioid misuse and abuse. So moving forward and looking at mentoring and opioids um, data that currently exists, what we know now is that um, as I show on the next slide, um, opioid-specific mentoring data is still needed. We have a lot of, um, unfortunately, age data in the field of mentoring, and so along with the age data, we do not really have a strong idea of opioids and mentoring and how that, um, how mentoring is really showing up and being supportive or not within um, the opioid epidemic work. There are mixed reviews regarding um, the mentoring impact on drug use prevention and substance use initiation. And um, there is significant evidence, however, uh, of positive effects of peer support for AOD treatment and recovery um, when we look at, you know, again, current and existing data. The next slide just highlights what most of us already know and from what we saw on the original uh, survey, most of you on the call are at least somewhat experienced in the mentoring field. And so we already know from the research uh, that the uh, mentor team did that mentoring um, increases the likelihood that youth are going to enroll in or graduate from college, participate in extracurricular activities, hold a leadership position and volunteer. Um, they find, you find that mentoring relationships are valuable, and of course, longer relationships tend to increase that value. Um, we also know from our uh, historical experiences that informal mentoring is equally as valued, and that the more risk factors a youth has, the more uh, they are likely to value a mentoring re relationship. So when we think about risk factors, which we'll go into in the next slide, obviously, um, these youth who are impacted by opioid use are certainly dealing with increased risk. So in this slide, I know Gabrielle's gonna be going over um, some other risk factors, but I wanted to focus specifically on family risk factors um, and talk about how these risk factors increase the likelihood for use, substance use, as well as other adverse behaviors. So from the family perspective, these risk factors include lack of parental supervision, which, are, which we're seeing a lot in um, parents who are using opioids, um, cold and unresponsive mother behavior, um, low parental warmth, parent hostility, low parental aspirations for the child, uh, poor parental attachment, parental favorable attitude towards drugs and alcohol, um, child abuse and neglect or maltreatment, sibling or parental modeling of drug use, as well as parent-child conflict. And then the reason I wanted to highlight these risk factors is because these are all um, 
elements and behaviors that you are likely to see in a household in which uh, the parent or caregiver is struggling with opioid use. So obviously this sort of just highlights the fact that youth who are um, in a household in which a family or care, uh, parent or caregiver is using, we have increased risk factors for again, drug use and other adverse behaviors. And looking on the next slide, um, I highlighted, which most of us, again, if you're experienced, as you've heard of the ACE study, the ACE study asks uh, 10 questions, which are highlighted in these three categories, abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. And many of uh, the items that you would see um, in this questionnaire relate back to that last slide as something that would likely to be um, part of the environment of a youth who's living with someone who's struggling with opioid use. So uh, whether it's abuse or neglect or even just the specific question of having a parent who's engaging in substance use. And then we also know that um, those who are engaging in substance use are oftentimes in and out of uh, jail or prison as a result of that. And then oftentimes we're also seeing mental illness as a struggle within those users as well. So we know that these risk factors are here as it relates to the ACE study. Um, and so it's just important to keep in mind that the ACE study gives us that data that connects to, again, what we're seeing with youth, youth who are impacted by opioids. So if you look on the next slide, it just focuses on, again, what we already know, um, which are the, the impacts of having ACEs. So these are some of the outcomes that are stated within the ACE study um, that folks who have more adverse childhood experiences are likely to uh, experience in adulthood. And so if you notice, you either have drug use, which in fact is a negative coping mechanism oftentimes um, used to uh, address pain and uh, negative emotions from a trauma, but you also have just generally other um, again, negative coping skills that are being implemented um, by these adults who've experienced adverse childhood uh, trauma. So that includes, um, you know, risky behaviors such as having uh, multiple sexual partners, um, early initi initiation of smoking, and different things like that. So you're seeing these are, this ultimately represents the parents and caregivers of the youth that we're trying to support in many cases. So moving forward, when we look at the next slide, with that being said, we're looking at protective factors. And um, these are the factors that are highlighted in research to indicate that would minimize substance abuse and other adverse behaviors. So obviously having high self-esteem, having good coping and problem solving skills, um, emotional self-regulation skills, good peer relationships, ability to make friends, academic mastery, and engagement and connections in school, sports, and religion are all um, protective factors. And the presence of a mentor we know in and of itself is a protective factor, but in fact, the presence of a mentor increases the likelihood that these other protective factors are either present or increased in their presence. So we know that mentoring is certainly a great response to um, these uh, situations that these youth are in um, in order to hopefully protect them from, again, either engaging in substance use or engaging in other uh, adverse behaviors. So I'm moving forward with sort of keys uh, to um, focus on when you look at mentoring youth who are impacted by opioids. A um, couple of things here. We always want to mentor through a trauma-informed lens, and I know that we use that language a lot, but what does that really mean? Um, one of the things I think is critical to focus on is not overlooking the fact that um, having a loved one who's struggling with drug use is in and of itself a trauma, right? So if you think about uh, put yourself sort of in the shoes of a youth and think about what it would be like to see your parent, someone you love, or a caregiver, someone you love, struggling with that drug use and seeing them harming themselves. That in and of itself is traumatic. And then we also need to ensure that, you know, as we start to really 
you know, hone in on the concerns regarding drug use, that we're not uh, overlooking the fact that many youth have other past traumatic experiences, experiences that they're dealing with, be it abuse, uh, neglect, or what have you. Um, the second piece that I think is important to focus on is that empathy is definitely required. And I think that one of the things we see with the opioid epidemic is the stigma that comes with it. And as a result of that stigma, we, we can struggle with having empathy. And so it's important to challenge ourselves, not just to focus on drug use prevention and academic success, you know, we always want to push our youth to be doing well in school, but just the human experience of, again, living within a community and an environment where all of this trauma is happening. And keeping in mind that oftentimes those adults, because we've seen where folks are really um, uh, impatient and, and just sometimes just mean uh, toward the parents of these youth because they're using and folks have their feelings about how they're treating the youth. But it's important to know that those are humans too, and they're having a human experience that we must be empathetic to. Third piece um, is just thinking about the cultural nuances and um, being thoughtful about race, culture, and other dynamics that are important in mentoring. And then lastly, as we know, we wanna have a descriptive, uh, uh, a uh, developmental approach rather than prescriptive, you know, when we're working with the youth. Um, and so wrapping up, I'm just going to share quickly regarding um, the uh, listening tour that I've been participating in and the work that I'm doing with Mentor to develop out um, some resources that we'll be um, um, distributing throughout the country. On the next slide, I'm highlighting um, sort of the scope of the um, trauma-informed mentoring response is the scope of the work. Our timeline is to complete everything by September 2019, and our final products will be a Train the Trainer, which will be hosted in Columbus, Ohio, as well as a four to five page document, which will focus on key knowledge areas and promising practices. Um, early findings in my listening tour and just talking to folks throughout the country, showing on the next slide, were certainly some myths that we're seeing where folks, when you look at the images on the slide, which I apologize if there's anything triggering here, but the purpose here is to sort of highlight uh, some of the myths involved with the opioid epidemic. Um, you know, there's sort of this focus on white rural um, Americans struggling with opioid use and it being a prescription drug piece. But in fact, we're seeing that folks from various races as well as locations are dealing with uh, this struggle and um, the fact, again, as I mentioned earlier, that we're seeing where drugs are being laced with opioids where someone might be using marijuana with no intent to use uh, opioids, but in fact, they've had situations where they've overdosed in the, and, and because there's a, an additional drug uh, within, you know, the marijuana that they're smoking. Um, on the next slide, just kind of highlighting the programs that I've talked to, it seems like most programs are sort of in the early stages of their opioid-focused programming. Um, their primary focus tends to be or at least from, from what I've heard so far, um, youth, drug use, and prevention, and um, just addressing a prevention sort of centered approach. Uh, what I see, what seems to be missing um, from what I've seen as far as the work folks are doing is again, um, sort of this overlooking the general traumatic experience these youth are having, having a loved one using, and you know, sometimes maybe too much of a focus on the drug prevention. So the work that we're doing and which will roll out in September is going to look at both youth that are at risk to use and abuse drugs, youth who are currently using and, and or are in treatment or needing treatment. And then lastly, just youth who are not necessarily at risk for either of those, but their family and caregivers are struggling with drug use and um, uh, misuse. Um, so on the last uh, slide here within my presentation, um, just want to focus on some things that I want to encourage everyone as you are continuing this work and um, you know, thinking through how your response to folks can be helpful is just to ensure that you have a trauma-informed as well as a culturally responsive approach to the work that you're doing. Mentoring is all about relationship and empathy is a pre prerequisite to all quality relationships. So again, let's just challenge ourselves to um, 
make sure that our response in caring for the folks and the youth that we're um, mentoring is not just about drug use prevention, but is also acknowledging their human experience of, of being within a household and with family members who are struggling with drug use. Um, the second thing I wanted to point out is, um, again, just thinking about that ACE study and understanding that um, when we focus on the trauma piece, those are those elements that ultimately uh, lead to drug use later. We saw in those slides earlier where we see the age of 18 to 25 being the area in which uh, the increased amount of drug use is happening. And in one of my interviews on the listening tour uh, with the CEO of Mary Haven, which is a treatment facility uh, for adults, he um, mentioned that the adults they're serving in treatment are the youth that we failed to properly support in their childhood. So again, just want to really enforce the importance of, of taking a holistic trauma-informed approach towards um, the, mentor, the youth that we're mentoring. And then lastly, just being very mindful of um, culture and sort of our history within the United States regarding drug use and how we respond to those impacted. When we look at the war on drugs and even responses to Native Americans and their struggle, you know, we've, we've sort of missed the mark in, in the past. And so we want to be really thoughtful and that we respond in a way that um, it includes everyone who's impacted um, to ensure that we're supporting folks in a very um, holistic manner. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, we'll be hearing a little bit more from you at the end of today's webinar, just ar around um, best practices that mentoring programs can apply when working with youth affected by opioids. But for now, I'm gonna go ahead and reintroduce our second panelist, Gabriela Zapata-Alma, who's gonna provide a clinical overview of how to work with youth who have or are at risk of developing a substance use disorder. Thank you, Gabriela. Hi, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. Thanks so much for having me today. So I'm here to talk about young people and substance use. Um, looking at you know substance use disorder diagnosis, is it relevant? Is it helpful when we're thinking about young people interacting with substance use? From there, looking at the spectrum of youth and um, experiences of substance use. Uh, I'll quickly touch on risk and protective factors since Elizabeth did such a great job already touching on that, and then zeroing in on what are our goals and principles when it comes to preventing youth substance use or escalation of uh, substance use by young people, and then rounding out with just some tips on how to talk with young people around substance use. Next slide. So, Substance use disorder criteria tend to focus on longer term negative consequences of use. And because of this longer term focus, many times it does not reflect the experiences of many young people. So some specific examples, next slide, are that young people are much less likely to experience withdrawal symptoms. Um, they're much less likely to describe their experience as being unable to stop using or to continue to use despite physical or mental health problems. Um, at the same time, young people are more likely to experience continued substance use despite interpersonal problems. And a lot of times this takes the shape as um, adults, family members, uh, people in school, really um, attempting to convince, coerce, um, engage the young person around not using, and then that continued use despite interpersonal problems shows up in this way. Something to note is that even the clinical term substance use disorder is very often experienced as stigmatizing, um, and that this may represent an adult's attempt to label a young person's experience. And so we wanna be really aware of um, just how adultism can show up when we're even talking about what we consider to be the problems related to substance use. So looking at the spectrum of use patterns, and this can be a much more helpful model in understanding uh, how young people interact with substances. So first of all, all the way on 
the non-youth end of the spectrum. Um, this is someone who has never tried or no longer uses a substance. And there can be a lot of different reasons here. Um, there can be a uh, healthy fear of substances. There can be religious reasons. There can be a, a lot of reasons why somebody in, uh, falls on this end of the spectrum. From there, there can be experimentation, which we talk about experimentation being a young person who has tried a substance once or twice. Um, typically, we talk about this being more alcohol or marijuana, and for whatever reason, they aren't interested in continuing. Um, this can be a very normative experience. I would say that um, what we've seen is that the vast majority of young people will try some substance at some point and kind of move on naturally. From there, looking at recreational use. So this is use that occurs on a regular basis, but the young person can still generally take it or leave it. It hasn't really taken up any space that is otherwise um, engaging in social um, activities or school. From there, we move into regular use. So regular use is the actively seeking out of substances on a frequent basis. So there's a preference of activities that involve using with peers, but there's still a concern around the potential cost of use. There's still concern and attention around things like school achievement, reputation, and parental approval. So all of those phases kind of fall into non-problematic um, patterns of use. Now moving into more risky or problematic patterns of use, we have a, a more mild to moderate phase, which is where we start seeing frequent substance use across multiple situations. But more importantly, here we start seeing a loss of interest in non-substance using activities that they once enjoy, enjoyed. And that can include decline in school, as well as problems with parents and family. And then, of the final phase on this spectrum of use patterns is the moderate to severe problematic pattern of use. And here we see a daily or near daily use with others who also use in what would be characterized as a more compulsive pattern. We also tend to see here that folks start seeking a more immediate route of administration. So in that we might see um, people seeking out and favoring higher proof alcohol. We might see See people switching to injection drug use, um, seeking out products that have a higher concentration of THC. By this point, uh, a sub criteria for a substance use disorder will likely be met. Um, I also want to point out that the vast majority of young people who, ex who experiment with a substance will not go on to develop a problematic pattern of use, and many of the adults who go on to experience a more long-term and severe substance use disorder do tend to begin their use in adolescence. So next we'll, we'll touch on some risk factors. So looking at risk factors for adolescent substance use, um, we see here that these are risk factors that happen from early childhood to later adolescence. Um, for example, when we see early aggressive behavior in those um, initial elementary school years, we, that has been shown to be a risk factor to go on to develop a substance use disorder later on, or the protective factor is being able to coach on that coping and on those self-soothing and self-control skills. Um, we also see that drug availability plays a role for young people. Um, and that I would add to this that the availability of alternative, healthier activities, the, the being able to engage in different kinds of ways in the community and not being left to, um, you know, just in, in a vacuum. And then, of course, poverty and racism within the community have been found to be very significant risk factors for substance use disorders. And so something that we need to keep in mind with the risk factors and protective factors is that they are exactly that. They are risks. They're not predictive. They don't seal anyone's fate. 
all they do is increase the risk, but they cannot predict an outcome. And so we're not here to look for risk factors in order to assign anyone's fate. Our focus is on being aware of those risk and protective factors so that we can help mitigate those risks as well as increase contact with those protective factors. Um, different risk factors are going to have different levels of importance across that uh, child to adolescent life phase. We're going to see peers are going to become much more important during that adolescent uh, part versus the, um, some of the more individual, the aggress early aggressive behavior versus self-control. That's more relevant in the earlier elementary school years. Next slide. So in looking at the impact that our current overdose epidemic has had on risk and protective factors for young people, Elizabeth did a really great job talking about some of the trauma pieces, including the ACE study. So rather than repeat that, I'm going to just mention um, a couple things that didn't get mentioned. And one piece that I think that we don't often talk about, but that plays a really big role and has a really big impact on young people's experience is the experience of our system-based responses to people who use substances. Um, so, you know, the lack of family-based treatment options where a mom has to choose between being able to protect and care for her children or going to treatment and addressing her treatment needs. Um, the lack of child care so that parents can effectively engage in treatment and the lack of a family focus within a lot of treatment settings. A lot of treatment settings only have services for the adult impacted and don't focus on resources or services for the children. And we know that many times the whole family is impacted by the substance use disorder. Um, another piece to be aware of is the potential impact of child welfare involvement. Um, so while child welfare is absolutely needed in many cases, we also know that, um, that there are some best practices out there for how to have effective child welfare responses um, to families where substance use is occurring. And so many best practices have found the importance of separating parental substance use from abuse and neglect. That there can be parental substance use in the household and there may be resources needed and support needed and that that is not equated with parental abuse or neglect of the children. And so, um, for example, in the state of New Jersey, they have adopted these best practices and they've seen a really positive impact where despite the overdose epidemic, the rates of um, a child being removed from their home has not increased. And so they actually developed a whole different track from their protective services system to focus on families where there's substance use present, but there's no presence of abuse or neglect, just so that they can facilitate their access to resources and the supports that are needed to help that family move forward. Next slide. The prevention goals. Um, the goal of prevention is to prevent substance use delay the initiation of substance use and the associated problems. And so here we see the brain development from age five to age 20, and really highlighting the prefrontal cortex, which we can think about as the, the brakes of our brain. So the brakes of our brain, the part that is about control, judgment, decision-making, is the, um, last part of our brain to fully develop. It's not really done developing till about age 26, um, which is why young people are so creative and funny and wonderful, right? Um, and it also tells us that the more that we can delay the initiation of substance use, the less impact we're gonna potentially have, the less adverse impact we're gonna potentially have on that control and judgment aspect of our brain. So evidence has shown that there are really great gains and reduced adverse effects if people delay their substance use. Um, there are like threshold effects at before age 14 is very risky. Um, if people can delay to age 16, 18, and 21, there are um, decreased adverse effects at each of those threshold ages. 
Next slide. So our, our principles for effective prevention. There's many important evidence-based principles, and here's a few to keep in mind. Um, we already talked about risk and protective factors, increasing positive coping and positive coping skills, involving young people in creating and delivering prevention programming. And this is kind of obvious, right? Like doctors like to hear information from doctors. Um, police officers like to hear information from police officers. Young people like to hear <laughs> information from young people. Um, some culturally responsive and tailored for local context. Avoid scare tactics. Focus on short-term and immediate goals, not long-term consequences, because we never think it's going to happen to us. And um, a really big question that tends to come up for young people is, how can I avoid drugs and keep my friends at the same time? So it's not enough to just coach young people on how to say no to drugs. Next slide. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to wrap it up. <laughs> so how do we talk, um, have some effective conversations around substances? Um, so we want to invite that open conver conversation, non-judgmental approach. Um, don't wait until a young person shows you that they're tuned out to start realizing, oh, I need to pull back here. Avoiding labels and otherwise stigmatizing language. Um, clearly communicating what can be kept confidential and what would need to be shared with another person, whether that be um, a parent or another adult clearly communicating that on the front end. Next slide, please. Um, and this is a topic that a lot of times if we try to tackle it head on, we're gonna get like a blank stare. So we can talk about media, pop culture, talk about current events that involve substance use. Um, something that's been found really evidence-based is first just asking about the young person's friends or peers. Um, substance use. What are their friends doing and how do they feel about that? Um, sharing our own experiences, not of substance use, but of remembering when we were young and it was hard to have someone that, that we felt like we could have these open conversations with. Next slide. And here, the importance of that gentle curiosity and active listening and that asking permission before providing information can really go a long way that even if someone is just like, yeah, sure, what do you got? Um, that that increases their listening and their being able to take in the information that we're providing. And so if we do provide information around substances, asking their permission, ask, getting their input on whether they're interested in more information, sticking to the facts and avoiding scare tactics, keeping it brief, and notice when we're coming off as lecturing well before someone starts tuning out, and then asking what they think about that information, whether they think it's true, whether they think it's relevant. Um, thanks so much. That's the end of my portion. Gabriella, thank you so much for sharing all of this helpful information about youth substance abuse. I am now going to reintroduce our third panelist, Chris Holtquist, who is going to talk to us about the different strategies that his mentoring organization, the Mentor Connector, utilizes to support youth. Thank you, Chris. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Benji. Um, so hello, everybody. My name is Chris Holquist. I lead uh, the Mentor Connector, and we are a, um, a community-based mentoring organization in the western side of Vermont. And um, we've been around for about 14 years, and we serve over 150 youth, age 5 to 25, um, serving an, an array of vulnerable populations. One of the, um, the pieces within our program, we have decided to really target a handful of different, uh, different populations. As you can see on the slide, um, we serve youth that are in uh, foster care. We have a program that serves a uh, foster care mentoring uh, program. We have a program that we uh, serve youth who are at risk of high school dropout, youth affected by opiate abuse, um, a youth in diversion of pregnant and parenting teens and our family mentoring program. So as you can tell, we have a lot of different programs that, that we run. Um, and to pull it all together, each of our, um, each of our mentor matches, as uh, most other programs, you know, they really can tailor fit their, uh, their match experience to the needs and the strengths of that youth. 
but every single one of our matches focuses on life skills, educational curiosity, which is just expanding their curiosity about life and our workforce development. And so about three years ago, um, on the next slide, you're gonna see the, um, we're gonna talk about our family mentoring program a bit, um, because about three years ago, based on all of the information that you've heard so far, uh, we saw this information and we, we saw that, um, that one of the challenges was that um, opiate use um, and really substance abuse across the board is generational. And we, we here in Rutland started to see a lot of generational use. Um, and so we, so we started working very closely with, um, with a handful of different, uh, different providers and with different uh, mentors across the board to really say, you know, what is it that we can do as an organization to really affect change um, across the board. And so what we started uh, working with was um, we actually uh, joined with Rutland Regional Hospital and uh, we started pulling together a family mentoring program that was really holistic in nature. Um, each, so the, the program that we run is that we actually work with families who are in uh, opiate treatment currently. And so one of the parents needs to be in, or is in treatment. And then we work, we provide a family mentor that, that works with the family unit as a whole. And they actually work on self-sustainability and protective factors for up to 12 months. And then every youth in the family um, is provided their own one-on-one -on -one mentor. Um, and so, so that one-on-one -on -one mentor is very similar to our other, you know, to the community-based model. But, um, but all of these mentors actually come together and they're supervised by a clinician that comes in and works with them um, on, a, on an ongoing basis to really, really support them. Um, within the, the training in this model, we actually um, work with very highly trained uh, individuals and we worked with the, the Rutland Regional Medical Center, um, the Health Department, Substance Abuse Prevention Coalition in, in the region, and we have a handful of counselors that we pulled together to develop a training so that all of the mentors, the family mentors and the youth mentors were very highly trained in understanding not only um, how, what, what's going on, the family dynamics, but really to understand and, and support the family and the youth in a holistic way. Um, one of the things that I, I wanna touch back on is that um, on Elizabeth's side, slide from um, the, the CEO of Mary Haven, you know, said that uh, the adults that they were serving currently are, um, are youth that we failed to serve um, back in the day. And, and that's really what we were seeing as well is that we really need a, a holistic, a comprehensive support system to really help these youth. And so our, our um, mentors actually go through the traditional uh, training process, um, like most other organizations, but we add in um, substance abuse um, training, we add in foundations of recovery, we also train all of our mentors in motivational interviewing, uh, ACEs or adverse childhood experiences, trauma and mental health first aid. And so we do, a, as you can tell, a lot of training around just supporting mentors and just really having highly trained mentors from the beginning. Um, on the next slide, you're going to see um, kind of some, some results from, our, uh, from the rise of opiates. This is just kind of a, a higher level overview that, um, that you'll see that, uh, that Rutland, the Rutland area really got hit hard with the opiate epidemic. Um, so we actually had a death in Vermont since 2004. Our, um, our overdose deaths actually increased incredible numbers, um, which of course prompted a rise in youth in our foster care system. And then um, on top of that, we're seeing a rise in our ACE scores um, for youth right now. And so, so we knew that we had to do something different. And so that's really the impetus for, um, for creating this program. And so over the past two years, we've been running um, the program and working very specifically with youth who are affected by opiate abuse and families that are affected by opiate abuse. And so we have a couple um, best practices from our, <laughs> from, our, from our past two years on, on what we've seen um, and, and really how we've worked with youth. And the first is really to invest in skilled and trained coordinators. Um, I can't tell you the, 
the uh, importance of making sure that um, that all coordinators that work with mentors are just highly trained, as trained as can be. Uh, we like to say that 70% of our mentor training actually happens post-match, so after they are matched. So, which means that um, no matter how much we put into the front-end training of matches, so the pre-match, we really know that they that we have to invest in that ongoing support, ongoing training. Um, and when we match, we actually um, we actually match community volunteers to youth uh, connected to op opioids. Um, basically, we we increase the training, so we we train them as as highly as we can, and then um, we have the additional skilled coordinators that support them um, on that on that other side as well. And so um, and so I would suggest for anybody else to um, you know really invest in training in your coordinators. So not only a lot of our coordinators are trained in in ACEs and trauma work, we do continual education around trauma and and our own trauma. So um, so helping coordinators kind of work through their own trauma as well, because a lot of this work that we're in is actually traumatizing for coordinators. Um, you know, we have story after story of uh, working with youth and just that um, that struggle of coordinators hearing these. Uh, these hard stories and then mentors hearing the difficult stories from youth um, time and time again. We also do uh, a lot of self-care and a lot of motivational interviewing. So, so motivational interviewing, if you've never used it before, it's a great technique, um, especially around mentoring, to help, um, and to help mentors rephrase how they talk to youth, especially around substance abuse, um, because it's a very non-judgmental um, and it's non-confrontational at all. And really what it is, is just, just helps you kind of um, uh, understand what is motivating them and helps them work towards uh, where the youth actually want to go. And the next slide is, uh, is the second piece that we have is, um, is really when matching, we consider a lot of different domains. Um, so a lot of programs, ma the matching process is kind of a, a, a difficult process. And what we've done is, is really see that, um, that mentors really have to be matched based on, um, on a lot of different domains. We used to match the, the mentor just across the board for, uh, for the youth. We would, just, we would just take the mentor and really understand the, the youth and just match um, based on that. And we used to talk about that um, really any mentor can be, uh, or any uh, adult can be a mentor. And what we started to see was that although I still absolutely agree that anyone can be a mentor, um, what we see is that, especially with, uh, with youth who are affected by opiate abuse, um, youth who are living in a home that it, um, with somebody who's either in recovery or actively using, or youth who are um, actively using substances, um, we really needed to have a higher trained mentor or a higher uh, a mentor who is able to work with the youth kind of on that level. And that was not necessarily just any uh, with any individual. Um, a lot of times we can we can train them more, but sometimes we had to find mentors that really had that skill set um, when they came to the table. Um, the second piece, you know, and then really looking across the board, especially working with um, with you, um, you know, we had to match our our youth and our mentor to the family system because a lot of our mentors um, they they can work with a youth really really well, but when it comes to the family dynamics, they might not be prepared for that. And so either we had to train for that, or we had to have a mentor that was really able to work with uh, within the family dynamics because that of course comes into the mentoring relationship. And then we had to match all of those three components to our program and, and the fit within our program and then to the community. And, and really taking all of those pieces into account really helps um, make the best match possible. Um, you know, what we, what we tended to see, especially with working with this population, was that, um, was that homelessness and low employment are two common situations that we, we run into uh, with families that are affected by opiate abuse. And when a mentor um, is really trained and, and matched well into, um, into that family, they then, they, they then have really great boundaries. And boundaries is one of the things that, 
is oftentimes the first thing to go because there's so many needs that the mentor is the first call that the family makes when there's a crisis. And so, so we need to make sure that, um, that we have uh, met the right mentor and matched uh, with the right family and trained and supported as much as, can, as we can. And, and the third uh, lesson that we have found is really um, that we need to provide a lot of support to these matches. Um, you know, one of the things that we saw, especially early on, was that, um, was that families who are um, coming from, from the uh, kind of the addiction field is that there were just a lot of needs that um, that the family was running into, and a lot of those needs are kind of just the um, kind of the the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, as you can tell. You know, the the safety, the housing, the food security, those kind of needs. And um, a lot of our mentors, what was happening is that because there were so many needs, um, you know, our mentors were getting calls, and then our coordinators were getting calls because of that. And so, so what we did is that um, that our we started creating a um, kind of more of a group model where we actually would bring together our mentors and provide that additional support. So we created um, a couple different tiers of and of support, and then we provided um, really made sure that all of our um, all of our mentors had access to each other so that they can call each other for support and that they really could depend on each other. Um, you know, really the benefit that we kept on seeing was that our, um, our mentors, when they would come together, they would actually be able to reinforce the tools that they were working on. Um, another piece is that our mentors were able to provide different perspectives when they all really came together. And then our youth, um, can provide peer support when, when we bring, when we bring, uh, youth and mentors together in that, in that format. And so what, what we started to see based on these, um, on this data, what we started to see is that we really were able to strengthen um, our services for, for youth and we were able to really provide that sense of belonging for youth, that sense of vision of hope for their future and kind of reframe and reformat the whole, um, uh, the whole support system. And so we, we really were able to um, to kind of bring a holistic view and a holistic support to to the family. And in working in partnership with the with the recovery um, program, we actually provided a lot of the systems that um, that the other uh, the other area couldn't really provide. Um, because a lot of times in the addiction world, they're really great at reducing substance abuse addiction. Um, but they're not necessarily wonderful at providing um, all of the support that goes around with the family and um, and interworking with the with the relationship. Um, and so, so Elizabeth is actually going to talk about um, her early findings and findings from um, from that uh, the tour that she was talking about, and really kind of the mentoring field and where the mentoring field comes in and strengthens us. Thanks, Chris. Great job. Um, so I'm going to just quickly go over. I want to make sure we leave time for questions and answers. But um, one of the last pieces that really stood out to me in the listening tour um, was just reflecting back to the NQMS and the, um, the elements of effective practice. Um, I'm hearing, you know, I heard a lot of folks just really you know, clamoring and having a real appetite for, you know, uh, opioid specific training and resources, which we're certainly creating, and I'm sure others are doing the same. Um, but one of the things that stood out that I think is really important is that we don't overlook what we already have that is super helpful, even as it relates to responding to um, this epidemic that we're in the midst of. So I highlighted on here, these are the elements of effective practice, the um, key pieces that are within the NQMS. And if you're not familiar with this, make sure you connect with your local, local mentor affiliate uh, to get more information about that. Um, but these were key uh, areas that I found, and, and Chris's program is actually one of the programs who I interviewed, 
it really stood out to me as areas that we can focus on moving forward. And being a former uh, affiliate director, these are also areas that I often saw programs struggle with the most. And so having a strategic plan and policies are really important. They're important for every mentoring program, but they're super important when you get into the depths and um, uh, dynamics of the opioid epidemic and all that comes with it. Um, the staff for your programming, recruiting folks who are experienced in AOD, which I know, which is alcohol and drug treatment, uh, or alcohol and drugs in general, Chris spoke about that in his presentation, um, as well as the training, which is under item D. And then I think one of the biggest pieces that stood out to me with Chris's program, um, and I think it's so critical, is the fiscal management element, which I know a lot of us struggle with. Um, the, the collaboration, Chris has been able to do a great job with getting funding for his program in ways uh, that are really creative and, and strong. And it's, it's done through a lot of collaboration with the medical field, police, and others. So it's really important that we remem remember uh, this element in the, um, in the, you know, again, basic outline of what makes a strong mentoring program. Again, going down to operations, recruiting mentors with some sort of background or experience is important, as Chris indicated. Um, there are certainly some additional realities here. Uh, that we have to account for, and that comes into the training of the mentors as well in Element M. And then family engagement was a huge huge piece that came out. Um, you didn't see that as much of a conversation, not to say that we didn't talk about it uh, prior to the opioid focus, but family engagement is really important when you're looking at um, serving youth uh, within who are impacted by opioids because of just all of those family dynamics that come in. And then the last piece I wanted to point out as we wrap up the webinar um, is really focusing on support. We know that we need to support mentors regardless of the type of program you have, but when you have mentors who are serving youth who are impacted by opioids, there's increased risk for vicarious trauma as a result of the dynamics of the overdose and just all of the family challenges that you see within um, a family dealing with this crisis. And I think that wraps us up. Benji, will you take it from here? Thank you, Elizabeth. And also to Chris and Gabriella, we're really fortunate to have all of your expertise on the webinar today. Um, we have now reached the Q&A portion of today's webinar, and I'm excited to pass things off to our question moderator, Pamela Gant, who has a few questions from the audience uh, to ask our panelists. Pam, do you have a question you'd like to lead us off with? I do. Um, Joy, I can't see the person's name who asked this, but they wanted to know where in New Jersey um, did you visit? Where was your site visit there? And I'm trying to scroll through this. It's a little difficult for me, so bear with me. And they wanted to know um, when you set up your mentoring program, or uh, as you we're setting up a mentoring program to address the use of opioids, what are some of the best practices that we know of? And I think you hit on it a little bit at the end with the NQMS piece. But if you want to take a stab yes. at it. Yes. So um, regarding the listening tour, so far I have I haven't actually. These were all uh, remote um, conversations and engagements that I did. Um, so they've been throughout the country. I've spoken to folks in Chicago, uh, Vermont, um, Tennessee, Ohio, and some others. I don't have the list readily available, but I really tried to be broad in the spaces that I connected with and really be diverse in the folks that I spoke to. And as you mentioned, Pam, for sure, yes, anytime you're starting a program, and I think that that was, again, the big piece here is that while this, there are some new realities that we're dealing with within this epidemic, we still yeah. have so much that's already proven to be effective. So I would encourage you to just look at those elements of effective practice that were on the last slide and start there. Okay. Uh, this question is for Chris and Gabriella. How does supporting, supporting youth affected by opioids compare 
to uh, supporting you affected by other types of, of, of abuse, uh, specifically, let's say, um, alcohol abuse? And then what are some of the similarities that you see? I will or go different. ahead and answer that. <laughs> this is Chris here. Um, I would say that that you know there really are a lot of similarities across the board, um, and we're in the process here in in Vermont of bringing an Icelandic model of community support um, to really kind of the prevention uh, prevention field as a whole, and a lot of it is um, is as when youth have belonging, purpose, and identity, they're really uh -huh. they have they have a sense of connection and really a sense of of worth, and so therefore there's a lot of um, there's a lot of strength and a lot of protection around those youth. Um, they still might use, but um, but there's a, a lower chance of kind of that ongoing use. I would say as a as a programmatic piece, um, some of the some of the challenges that that we've seen kind of the difference is just the the level of use, um, and then kind of the the generational. Uh, piece that we've seen just because because we've seen uh, most of the youth who um, who use alcohol the community response surrounding alcohol is very very different than the community uh, kind of viewpoint around opiate abuse opiate abuse has a lot of stigma to it there's a lot of shame that's attached to it and so we have to work when we're working with youth and families that's pre specifically where we start on reducing that shame and really helping connect them to resources that are that you know that don't uh, continue to shame them that don't continue to look down upon them um, and that's kind of a significant shift from kind of the alcohol or other drugs that we've seen okay i have another question here i can't see all of it but it looks like um would you discourage programs that don't address the family as a whole um, from participating in, in uh, uh, mentoring around opioid abuse. And I'll leave that open for any of the three of you. I, I can jump in on that. Uh, this is Elizabeth. I would say I wouldn't necessarily discourage, meaning that if you, it's not so much that you need to address the entire family as in treat, the, or not treat, but, you know, respond to the entire family, but Regardless of youth being uh, uh, impacted by opioids or not, any time that you're not connecting with a family, you're certainly missing some huge pieces. The opioid piece just adds another layer to that. So it's not so much that your your programming has to specifically address the family, but it should at least include inclusion of and thoughtfulness about how the family dynamic and experience uh, impacts that youth. And Chris, you may want to add to that as well. I would agree with that, with that exact thing. Um, we are actually looking to expand our family mentoring model um, to, to all families um, because there's, there really are some pieces. Uh, working in the, family, in the family world, there's just a lot of families who are struggling and they really need kind of that, that additional support and the mentoring really be, is able to bring in a peer model that really supports the family on that peer level as opposed to a clinical level. And that's, we've seen a huge uh, response and a huge uh, support system. And the data speaks for itself that it really is a lot more supportive on a, on a peer level. Okay. I have another question for, uh, for anyone on the panel. Um, where can um, uh, folks find resources that will tell them how to talk to kids um, about abuse uh, when they're left behind, when their parents, if I'm interpreting this correct, who are left behind uh, when their parents are users? So if their parents go away to, I guess, rehab or jail or what have you, or the kids end up in foster care, how are we talking to them? And what should, where should we look for resources? Don't everybody answer at once. Uh, uh, I was trying to pause. Oh, this is Gabriella. I figured this is, you would jump in. <laughs> yeah, this is Gabriella. I think that in that case, 
you know, the most important thing we can do is listen and just okay. um, ask how they're doing, ask how they're feeling, um, ask how it's going, ask how we can help, uh, make it very clear that we're here to support them, that transitions are hard, that loss is hard, right? Um, and to really listen as much as possible and then find out what kinds of things that they want to focus on. You know, it's, sometimes it's helpful to talk about what's going on. And other times we're not ready to talk about what's going on. And it's a lot more helpful just to focus on something completely different and just try to feel like a person for a little while. Um, you know, when it comes to talking about substances in general, uh, with young people, NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, has some great resources um, and tips. Um, the American College of Pediatrics, I think it is, has a really great tip sheet around talking around marijuana. Um, so there are some tip sheets out there, um, but in the case where someone is experiencing loss because of substance use, loss of a parent or loss of a, a family home, I would really focus just on being fully present and sitting with them in their pain without trying to fix anything. Very good. I think the fixing is where the problems really occur. Um, and I would question. just add that, I, real quick, Pam, I just want to add, as we wrap up this work in September, our goal is to sort of collect a list of those resources as well. So look, be on the lookout for that. Okay, great. Um, what are some um, examples Pam, of... Pam, Pamela, I'm sorry. I think that we actually are starting to run out of time on the, the webinar. Oh, okay, Benji. I'm done. <laughs> Great. No, thank you um, so much for all of your help with moderating the questions and to okay, everyone no in the audience who shared their questions with us, too. As we close out today's webinar, I wanted to briefly share some other resources that may be applicable from the Mentor Network. Uh, next slide, please. Mentor scales impact by developing and supporting a national network of affiliates. These affiliates, like my organization, Mentor Vermont, provide the leadership and infrastructure necessary to support the expansion of quality mentoring relationships, either in local communities or statewide. Um, mentor affiliates also serve a unique role as a clearinghouse for training, resources, public awareness, and advocacy. Um, we encourage everyone who's in the audience today to find out if you have an affiliate for Mentor in your region and um, try to connect with them to learn more about local sources and local resources and training opportunities um, like this webinar today. Additionally, we encourage you to register your program with the Mentoring Connector, which is a national database of mentoring programs. Uh, this zip code searchable database, which is online and can be accessed through a computer or a smartphone, allows mentors and mentees from across the country to find your program um, and is connected to uh, LinkedIn, MBA Cares, Mentor.gov, and many other avenues of free program promotion. Finally, we encourage you to check out the OJJDP National Mentoring Resource Center website, which has other no-cost mentoring resources to help you apply evidence-based mentoring practices for your program. The NMRC provides evidence reviews on mentoring models and mentoring for special populations, implementation resources, anything ranging from training manuals to mentor guides that are reviewed by the Resource Center Research Board, um, a blog featuring innovations and best practices, and the opportunity to request all sorts of um, training and technical assistance at no cost to your program. And again, as a reminder, one week after the webinar, all attendees are going to receive an email with a link to the Collaborative Mentoring Webinar Series webpage. <clears throat> there you'll find the recording, slides, and also additional resources. And lastly, don't forget, we also are hoping to get your feedback um, as you exit the webinar. At the end of the webinar, um, please answer the short survey and help us work to make this series even better. Once again, be sure to visit the Collaborative Mentoring Webinar Series page on the Mentor website, and you can find, in addition to this webinar, um, an archive of all the past webinars and information about webinars that are coming up in the future, too. You'll see the recording for this webinar should be up there within one week of today's broadcast. And once again, thank you again to all of our presenters and to everyone who joined us on the webinar today. 
We hope that you'll consider joining us next month on Thursday, July 18th, where we'll have our next webinar in the series, Promoting STEM Engagement Through Mentoring. And once again, as you exit the webinar, we hope you'll briefly take a couple minutes of your time to answer a short feedback survey about your experience with the presentation today. Thank you everyone for joining us.